go. Good. Ciao, Mark. Ciao. Good to see you, Stefano. How are you, my friend? Good, good, good. Despite the circumstances, um, yeah. it's, good I, to be, I, it's good to be healthy. Yeah, I was waiting for you in Padova, actually, these <laughs> days. <laughs> <laughs> for the fans, we were there eating the little crabs, but yeah, we couldn't do it. yeah. You know, you know, a, a lot of people at the beginning when we invented uh, the festival uh, asked me, but sorry, what is global health? What do you mean by global health? So now I say that that's global. <laughs> health. Now, now, now you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> and and now you understand what global health is. So you have no barber shops? Um, open. We have, well, we have them. They're just not open, and we're not allowed to go. No, me neither. So yeah. we have a uh, strange, uh, yeah, yeah. So trying to. Yeah. Anyway, you know that's. Uh, should all wear hats? The fedora should come back. Yeah, yeah. Wear, so. so, so the 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 issue, you know, that I I'm I'm just back from Sardinia, but Saturday I'll I'll go back there, which is a um, it's a nice comparison with. To what is happening in, in in the U.S. and in Africa? Because actually, in Sardinia, we have not a lot of cases of yep. ov overt cases, let's say diagnosed cases. But we we looked at the uh, mortality, excess mortality data, and all over uh, Sardinia, even where there are no overt COVID cases we had like 700% excess mortality in some little town. So this means that the virus is there uh, and, and we don't know. And, and, and the, the, the number of uh, infected people is huge. We, we think we have millions uh, around. And I, what do you think about the uh, US, for example? Oh, I think the same is the the same is true. I mean, we're we're limiting tests largely to people who are very symptomatic or hospitalized, um, and we know the virus is spreading in an asymptomatic way. Um, and I suspect, you know, South Korea is estimated for every ten, one infection they diagnose, there are ten uninfected. This is a yeah. country that's tested pretty aggressively. To me, that means in countries that aren't testing aggressively, we probably have you know 15, 20 times more. Um, and if we are not out now aggressively testing for, we should be doing surveillance RNA testing, um, uh, particularly among young people who can be carrying and be very asymptomatic, or we actually have no sense of the scope of the size of this epidemic, and we can't we can't calculate it. You know, with influenza, we calculate because we've had so much experience from it, we can calculate the act, the, what we think is the number of cases, estimate based on those who seek medical care. We can't do that with this infection because we have no idea, which means we don't know what the infectivity rate is, we don't know what the death rate is, and we don't know what the genetic drift is because there's so, much, so many people out there that are probably infected and doing okay. Um, so I, you know, It reminds me of the early days of HIV when we said, oh, everyone has a symptomatic prodromal disease. Yeah. And then we found out that, no, actually 50 to 60% of people never know they got infected because they have yeah. no prodromal infection. It's just the tip of the iceberg we yeah. see. And actually, uh, I would like to ask you from um, an immunological point of view, uh, the fact that, that, that there are so many people infected in a sense, without symptoms and not in intensive care, let's say, which is a drama because we have a, a, dra yeah. a death drama. Um, is it good or not? I mean, I doubt that the uh, this infection uh, gives you a, a, a persistent immunity. And what, what do you think? I mean, we are looking at neutralizing antibodies, yeah. Yeah. But, but what do you think about, are they protected, those that have been infected? We don't know yet. Um, uh, very disturbingly, I mean, we've, we're seeing the reports now of the uh, people who we know were infected uh, and recovered where we can't find antibodies. And by some estimates, that's a third of them. Um, And we also know that with coronaviruses, now this is a unique coronavirus, so we have to be careful not to generalize, yeah. but with, with at least some coronaviruses that have been studied, 
the immunity is not persistent. So no. you can get infected a year apart with the exact same coronavirus. Exactly. The, the issue would be, um, and this is, we can't, we shouldn't compare so much to influenza. I mean, everyone's afraid of comparing it to influenza because it's a very different of disease. Course. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking at trends and in other infections to get some indication. Um, you know, could, could it be that if you have, have coronavirus this time, you could get it again, but, but in you a, won't in, get it sick. Yeah, you, could, you may have a, a, a um, less aggressive infection. Less, less severe form, and that would be the hope. Um, but that's something we don't know, and that's why we need to know, goes back to we really need to know who got infected this time, um, which means we need to be doing aggressive RNA testing now. We need to be doing aggressive serology testing when it's available in a surveillance way to try to understand what the infection looks like and then actually follow those people should we have another wave. And that's what really worries me. If we get another wave of this, what's going to happen? Will the immunity be there? Will it not be there? How will people who were infected the first time fare in the second time? Because yeah. we know, for example, in the flu pandemic of 1918, a lot of people who were infected in the first wave died in the second wave. Yeah, because these biphasic, biphasic uh epidemiological um, pattern is common in some of these respiratory infections. So this is what worried me. So first, we know that there are many more, many more than what we know that are infected. Are they protected? Uh, will they have a less aggressive second reinfection? That's something we, we need to, to understand. And because Really, I think that the, uh, let's say, the concept of herd immunity yeah. can, can be, we, we can have a herd immunity just through a vaccine, I think. A vac if, a well, yeah. a, a, and if it's, it's, if it's yeah. highly effective um, and the virus isn't mutating enough, like, you know, we have, we have influenza vaccines, they're, they're moderately effective, they are not yeah. highly effective. So depends on a lot that we don't know yet. And it gets to who's infected now, how many infections are there, what's the antibody response, do the antibodies protect? And I think genetic drift, you know, the, and I'm in an argument with some epidemiologic friends and some um, global health friends about this right now. I mean, I think we need to be looking for RNA testing on a surveillance basis to understand the genetics of the virus as well. I mean, we do have a pretty good phylogenetic tree of those who are diagnosed, but the people who recover well on their own are the ones that are putting immunologic pressure on the virus to mutate. To mutate. Not yeah. People who get sick, their, their immune system didn't respond, right? It's the people who are, who, who get, are asymptomatic, are mildly symptomatic, whose immune response is actually putting the pressure on the virus to mutate. So if we don't understand what's happening to the mutational pattern, the genetic drift, not that it's going to jump to be aerosolized, but that it could change enough that whatever immunity was designed or whatever immunity we're going to we're design not, in a not vaccine work. based on people who were infected might not work. And th this is where global health is so important because, you know, it looks like um, whether it's seasonal or not, and I, you know, there are arguments back and forth and the seasonality will be overridden by other factors, but there's a lot of infection in the Southern hemisphere. It, Assuming, you know, we do actually see a trail off by June and then we just have sporadic outbreaks from travel as restrictions are lifted. If there's a lot of infection happening in the Southern Hemisphere uh, during our summer, during their winter, especially deeper south, we need to understand that. We need to know what's happening with the virus. And that means testing more than the people who are symptomatic. And it's a very young population. Um, so you could expect perhaps not as much infection, even though there are a lot of young people with HIV. Uh, most people, most young people don't have HIV. So, you know, we, if we do not understand what's happening with the virus for the next six to eight months, we could be in really, really bad shape in the fall. And, you know, the National Academy of Sciences here just pointed out second waves are not common with, with you know, pandemics. They do happen. Ten of them have happened with influenza over the last 250 years. Yeah. Every one of them, remarkably, was six months later than the first wave. Whenever the first wave happened, spring, winter, summer, doesn't matter. Six months later, the next the wave. Second happened. wave, yeah. And this is why we need to stop it now 
uh, at least to know, to to look where where the fires are, and 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 w w so what what I'm very much concerned is Africa actually. Yeah. Uh, because I don't know what response from Africa will be. I don't know <coughs> what's the death rate now in Africa. Is it better? Is it um, or we don't know. We we we. We don't know, um, perhaps be a little bit like Sardinia or the places you mentioned, you know, <coughs> deaths are happening, but they just don't know. But, you know, all, they're, they're in effectively a third wave of the global, this current pandemic. So the, well, the fourth, I mean, first it was yeah. Asia, then it was Europe, then the United States, and now the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so they're relatively new in their infections. They're all imported cases. Um, all but two countries have reported cases in Africa, but the vast majority of cases are in Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, and South Africa. And um, Ethiopia, Ethiopia too. Ethiopia, but it. on a on a numeric basis, it's pretty. Yeah. It's smaller. Yeah. They have yeah, a large smaller. population, so they definitely lots of countries have cases, but the largest cases are in those countries. Algeria and and um, Morocco are mostly because of tra uh, travel from France. Absolutely. South Africa, you know, there's a lot of international travel to South Africa. They're, you know, they're in their summer, so it's high tourism season. So, but it's not spreading as best we can tell as quickly. But again, they're heading into their winter, and there is, you know, temperature, humidity, sensitivity. But that can be overridden by population density, comorbid factors, yeah. travel. So we, I'm very worried about Africa. However, they're responding really well. I mean, they shut their border. Many countries shut their borders yeah. really yeah. rapidly. Yeah. Um, social distancing is going to be more difficult because of cultural issues, you know, cultural norms where communal act, communal life is very common, including in hospitals, as you know. Um, um, so, and it's a very young population, but there are a lot of comorbid factors. So what happens in Africa, we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. And, but it, the, the spread could take off, you know, dramatically, or it could not, if we support them so that, you know, the, the good thing about it is that they are responding rapidly. Unlike the rest of the world, they're taking it as a continental-wide issue, not a country-by-country -country issue. The heads of state are talking, the African Union is getting engaged. Um, President Ramaphosa is the African Union chairperson right now is, is aggressively talking with quite a number of heads of state. The heads of state are talking to each other. They're looking at regional approaches. I mean, they're, they're ahead of where the rest of us are. In no, absolutely. Of I, yeah, absolutely. I remember when, when the, the epidemic started in Italy, uh, mainly in Lombardy, actually, um, uh, the French TV um, interviewed me saying, hi, uh, why uh, you have such a high number of cases, and we don't. And I say, sorry, uh, not to be, um, <laughs> but you will see them, you know, yeah, very yeah. soon. I mean, because, uh, and this is something that actually Europe didn't um, put their efforts together. That's something which is very clear, yeah. both uh, from from a strategic point of view and, and uh, an economic point of view. Africa is doing better. Well, well, what about out. and and something you've studied is you know there's a lot of community health based workers right and these community health based workers have been put in place to fight HIV tuberculosis malaria I mean there are yeah. cadres out there looking for people with fever for for other reasons it was those cadres actually that responded to the Ebola crisis and prevented Ebola from spreading um, in Mali in Senegal in Cote d'Ivoire yeah around in around around yeah. the um uh, i mean lagos had the Congo, yeah. it was really the vaccine preparedness response team for polio that came down to lagos and helped build, build the community response so there is a substrate for testing uh, uh tracing and quarantine that's probably better than any of our countries have and and that approach t2q for me test trace and quarantine is why south korea singapore taiwan they other did it. have yeah. done well they use technological responses, but Africa, many countries in Africa have an infrastructure and at the community level to do that. Um, and they're used to doing it for pandemic responses. Yeah, so that's true. The opportunity, if we just support them a little bit, you know, we could, uh, we could actually help them, support them to keep their caseload low 
but also for us to understand what's happening with the evolution of the virus and the trajectory of the virus so that we're better prepared for the fall. So it's a humanitarian issue, but it's also a deeply self-interested issue. If we don't know what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere, we are flying blind into the fall. Absolutely. And it could be a disaster. Yeah, and South America is also uh, something yep. different because they are not accustomed to, to fight epi pandemics. So they may have less uh, tools uh, yes. like the ones that you were uh, alluding to um, yes. in terms of seeing, community response. Yeah. We're seeing something similar there. You know, the, the infections are clustered in a handful of countries, as best we can tell. Again, testing is not happening at very large scale. There are some really some anomalies, like everyone points to Guayaquil and says, look, uh, temperature and humidity must have no impact on the spread of the virus because Guayaquil has this terrible rate of infections and a lot of people are dying. Well, what happened just before that outbreak? A bunch of workers from Guayaquil from who spend who work for their lives in Italy and Spain came back for the Easter holidays just before the pandemic took off. So travel tra travel and movement will overcome and density will overcome any benefit that there might be from temperature and humidity. Um, so we have to be very careful about under you know about our assumptions. But you know, deep southern uh, the below the equator in Latin America is also heading into winter, um, and so we need to be very careful and really understand what's happening. Yeah, we, we in, do need in to in the southern hemisphere, not just Africa. We don't need to hope for the good season, let's say, because unfortunately, the good season. Uh, uh, invites people to travel, and yeah. uh, you know, the other day I was coming back from from Sardinia to Rome for a little while, and we were in the big ferry boat. I mean, enormous. We were five people, so that was a good thing uh, yeah. because that was just before Easter. Right, two cars, one truck, and five people in a boat that holds like. 3,000. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that was a good sign of people saying, um, of course, I had my permit, blah, 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 uh, because I could be arrested. But now I'm coming back Saturday. and uh, But we are trying to do the same in Sardinia um, in, ter in terms of understanding that the numbers are not the numbers that are uh, shown in, in the TV. The numbers may be much more. What, what about a vaccine? I think, I really think that the only w good thing for the future would be uh, to give some immunity, maybe some, because yeah. as you said, we, we don't know the drift, the shift, etc. of this virus. The only possibility would be to have a, a vaccine. Uh, what are the possibilities that this virus sh um, chain uh, evolutes um, like, like influenza, for example, yeah. because uh, they don't, I mean, coronavirus do not change too much in, in general, the, old, the, the, the ones that we have with us. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you know about this one? Well, we don't know yet. I mean, what, what we do know is that there are very conserved regions um, and there are key regions. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen the current phylogenetic tree. There's a lot of variation. I think they've identified something yeah. like 5,000 strains already. The Faroe Islands alone, tiny little place, has identified thousands of strains. What we don't know is, will that matter? And in general with coronavirus is it doesn't. Um, um, that there's mutations, but they don't fundamentally change the, the disease pattern. Um, but this is a new one. So it, it's very so hard to say. And we've never experienced this type of um, um, this, this virus. So it, it's very difficult to say. Uh, presumably and hopefully, um, um, because it is, while it mutates, it, 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 it also conserves or preserves its regions, that will be okay and that a vaccine will be highly effective. Um, but to me, that's why we need to be looking at what's happening outside of the hospitalized patients or the symptomatic patients, because the people who are putting pressure, immunologic pressure on the virus are the ones in all likelihood who are responding well to it. So we could also learn what their antibodies look like relative to the antibodies of people who are not 
doing yeah, well yeah. and maybe develop a better vaccine. So, you know, I, again, I think it comes back to we have an opportunity to now that more test kits are being produced to do mass testing as the virus continues through the next several months, even if it goes down, as you point out, even as it, even it goes down, as it looks like it's doing, as restrictions are eased, as travel happens, we're going to continue to have outbreaks all over. If we have good testing, uh, tracing, and, and quarantine, then we can manage that. If we don't, you know, we're going to have a very bad well, we could next have very months, bad, yeah, Absolutely. You know? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm also, we have an opportunity to go to, to to be testing all over the world so that we really understand the virus. And you know, best case scenario, this just disappears like SARS-CoV-1, you know, from 10 years ago, um, with really strong public health measures. But this is a global one. You know, SAR, the first SARS didn't get out of um, a handful of, of countries. Yeah, absolutely. And it and was even, well and even MERS. And actually, yeah. the, uh, both SARS and MERS were in a sense, giving very acute infections and severe. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. cases were less uh, asymptomatic. Right. So right. It, w it was easier okay. to trace them right. and, to, and, to, and to isolate. Um, but MERS is a little bit different to me because, it, you know, the most we still have MERS outbreaks, as you know, yeah. from camels yeah. because it comes from camels, you know, infected camels. So yeah. MERS is a little bit different. Um, uh, but but yes, um, the uh, the positive of that to look at is that the countries that have responded well this time, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, China actually had the system in place. They just didn't activate it. Now they do have it in place and are doing well um, as they eased restrictions. All of those countries put in very strong testing, tracing and quarantine approaches yeah. because of their SARS and MERS epidemic. They knew that. They knew. They knew the history. But yeah. There, are, there are some cases coming back in China. I so. saw. There are, of course, they're coming back, and um, they're in in especially the as you know, as soon as Wuhan let people uh, ease restrictions, there were new cases, but they were all imported cases, which gets back to, you know to the travel pieces. As soon as you ease restrictions and people move around, you know, you're gonna have cases. Um, certainly, if you allow international or cross border, or if you're uh, in Europe, you know you're gonna you're gonna see cases. Then the question is, do you have in place the testing, treating, testing, tracing, and quarantine to manage that? And if you do, you'll be fine. If you don't, you're gonna have trouble. Absolutely. Singapore, Singapore, as you know, had a despite their system had a quick uptick in cases, yeah. probably because, in my view, I mean, we have to study this in Singapore. Singapore is one of the most international countries in the world. I mean, it's tiny and it's all about finance and banking. So people come in and out of Singapore all the time. So um, they had a real quick uptick and had to reimpose restrictions. So far, we haven't had, China hasn't had to impose restrictions, South Korea hasn't, but we'll see as time goes on whether or not they do. Absolutely. And so everyone is looking for drugs. Uh, yeah. Personally, I'm not very much in favor of all these repurposed drugs, let me say. I'm also a little scared because I saw, um, I work on a couple of big trials, European PAN, European uh, solidarity trials, and I, I am on the DSMB and actually I really see a lot of um, serious unexpected reactions, but they are they are really not pretty much. It's difficult difficult to differentiate from from the disease itself. Right. Right. So, so in a sense, people is waiting for a drug, and yeah. what I think is that we need a specific drug. We cannot repurpose drugs. So, I'm I'm pretty sure that. What What do you know about? the future I mean, will we ever have a, a specific drug for this coronavirus theoretically yes i mean it does like hiv it does, like all viruses they need the host system in order yeah. to function and they do have pockets and they need you know the same type of cellular machinery um, i actually work with a caveat i'm the executive vice chair of a biotech company that's doing this uh, a very a brilliant scientist who's come up with a way that's very specific to this virus to induce cell death um, um, of in infected cells, hijacking the system that the virus uses to replicate itself. Um, 
we need a second, we need a wave of that type of research. Right now, as you pointed out, the basement, we can't get funding for that type of approach because everyone's just repurposing and saying, we'll be fine, um, which I think is a big mistake. Yeah. Um, a big mistake. And um, we should be looking for specific um, drugs. Now, it's possible people are just looking to see. Pandemics generally don't stay forever. New viruses generally don't stay forever. This type, respiratory viruses. But we don't know that. And so uh, I'm possibly people are just looking for what do we have off the shelf, which we did with HIV, right? Yeah, is a I, I remember the same time we used everything, yeah. whatever we had on the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. And then but it took a lot of years to yeah. get the right one. Maybe but now technology is technology is uh, advanced so far. Advanced. I mean, look, look at how rapidly new drugs are being produced for HIV, right? I mean, we have crystallography, we have different different approaches that can actually see the virus and where its weak, weak spots are. You should be able to design drugs for that. But, you know, it's going to take a significant effort to do that. And um, I'm not sure from a drug company perspective um, that there's an incentive to do it until we know what this looks like. If this actually disappears, you're going to spend a couple hundred million, billion dollars on a drug that, and then, a, then, that might never know. Yeah, that, that's that's the point because even even for uh, for um, SARS, actually the vaccine was not produced because SARS in a sense disappeared. Yeah. So uh, and we don't know if this guy uh, will disappear. Right. Is, is is a real beast? Don't know. And and, um, and this is not the first SARS because it's all over the world now um, already. And I think because of what you we started this conversation with, I mean. I, Maybe we'll be proven wrong, but I, I think there is massive asymptomatic and very mildly symptomatic infection going on. That's why it's global so quickly. That's why that's the difference between, as you pointed out, the first SARS and what we're seeing, what you're seeing with those increased deaths. I really think we're, we have a lot of infections we're missing. But should we all wear masks? I mean, just uh, because people ask them, is they say, should I wear, uh, everyone should for for the rest of his life wear a mask <laughs> when going out or <laughs> or not because uh, i i don't know uh, it should be a little bit effective but i'm i'm not sure it's the in a sense we were accusing you know the chinese that yeah. used to go to wear masks even before the coronaviruses they were here in rome with the mask and yeah. say hey look at these guys with the masks now we are all going around with masks and uh, that's um, one 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 issue. Um, I don't want an answer because I, you don't have an answer for masks. No, but um, what we are trying to develop, but uh, again, it's country. Um, but technology could absolutely help. Um, yeah, you know, Georgetown University. Amazingly enough, there's a guy who came from the security um, sector who's created basically the ability to trace with a totally secure system, totally private system, where you can get data from airlines, yeah. from cell phones, from yeah. public transport, from, um, uh, you know, we can, as you do in Europe, check the license plate when you move on the road so you know where people have been. That can all go into what they call a black box, and data can come out of it in a totally anonymized way, either for reporting or if a text gets sent to someone to say, you were on the plane, you were on a plane with someone who was exposed, go be seen. The only person who would ever know that is the person who received it. What worries me about, I have two worries about the other technologies that are being utilized. One, one is um, it's haphazard, as you pointed out. So it's not systematic. Um, yeah. And some of them even require voluntary entry, especially the social media one. So I had, yeah. I got uh, um, coronavirus. So I'm telling. And you, this, yeah, this you is, have an app and you tell this. Yes. Yeah. Either voluntarily or involuntarily, we could have a lot of incorrect information going into those systems. Yeah. You know, personal reporting is historically in anything is not terribly good, um, and you could miss a lot um, by doing that. And then the second big issue is if the, if the organizations designing those are the organizations that are the current big data players. What are they going to use those data for? They can promise us all they want. We've received lots of promises, <laughs> uh, but um, and that haven't panned out. And secondarily, I mean, 
uh, you go to the southern hemisphere, you don't see a lot of iPhones. I mean, it's not this is not Apple-based products. They're different products um, and different types of products where you're not just going to have to where you're not going to be able to use the same approaches. So I worry that it's it's haphazard, um, that it um, does, will not be global in nature, and that we could have poor data going in, um, especially on a voluntary basis, not comprehensive enough, if your cell phone's not on, if you're not on social media. So you could be very, bad data. very happily mislead. Yeah. Uh, misled. Uh, actually, I received the other day from... Uh, let's say a company that we all know um i don't know why because i think i um, accepted something in my phone they uh, said oh, this is a report of where you have been in the last four years so really i i was amazed that it was true i said and also the train they say you took the train from roma to trento and that day it looks in, in, in a sense, it was good because the restrictions that he put forward were, uh, in a sense, respected by the people. There were less movement. You know, the curve of movements went flat. So people was not moving yeah. from one, you know, I, uh, cell to another cell because that's that's the way they... Yeah. So, in a sense, uh, I have this, you know, the same reservations you have on these mobile app, apps um, in terms of um, effectiveness, let's say. Uh, let's see. Of course, it's... Um, it's better than nothing. It's uh, better than nothing, yeah. And, uh, and basically, in a lot of our countries, we have nothing in terms of test, trace, and, and quarantine approaches. Yeah, yeah. And um, we, because we haven't had an outbreak, whereas countries that have put them in place, the real question is, will we put effective procedures in place and will we maintain them? Because this isn't the last pandemic we're going to have. No. Uh, so whether or not you know we have another wave of this one is yet to be seen but there are going to be more pandemics and they're going to be emerging from all over the world and you know we the, if we don't put these systems in place after this um then we're sustainable long-term systems i mean the 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 countries that responded well don't just have these things in place they actually practice them they do effectively war games you know they they yeah. they say all right you know, when there's not a pandemic, they say, they just call in the system and say, pandemic, this is happening now, what do you do? And everyone practices what they do. You know, if you don't do that, and we need a global, what, what we've called for is a global task force that would be put in place now. It has to cross the private sector, the security app on yeah. time because there are other diseases going on. We don't have that need. And so what what systems can we have in place that will allow for that constant at a certain level, effectively war games, simulations happening, and what surge capacity is in place so that we can call on yeah. it needed. And that's what we need to put in place. And historically, we start to put them in place, then the crisis abates and we go off and do something else until the next problem. And then we yeah. start. And then, yeah. We, and I think we also need a network for labs. Uh, yeah. You know, or surveillance labs uh, equipped, uh, and with was there were like three or four talks on that, um, including Peter Doherty. Yeah, uh, uh, that he's now working on um, one the one health issue, and uh, right. which is which is actually what we are experiencing now. So um, so that let's help. You know, after fighting against HIV AIDS, I I hoped to uh, to have done. You know, what I'm saying now, now we are back on the job, and uh, really, I I really hope uh, that we will that will end. Actually, I saw a paper the other day of one. I don't know if it's a scientist or it is, is an epidemiologist saying, you know, all these pandemics end after 80 days. You, you, I don't know if you saw this. You say it's, it's, it, history is this 80 days, you need 80 days and then they go down. Um, and you don't even need, need quarantine. <laughs> I mean, that was, I think that was a mistake that someone um, thought. I think that quarantine. At least, um, at least minimized uh, the the death uh, rate uh, yeah. of this epidemic, and and. Um, well, I mean, to be honest, 
I, I don't under, I understand if you look in history how you could say that. Um, I don't understand how you can say that if you think about what's different. So, you know, the last big flu pandemic we had was in the 60s, and it wasn't that big. 2009 didn't really work out to be what we thought yeah. it was going to be. As you pointed out, SARS was very different because people died right away, and there yeah. weren't a ton yeah. of asymptomatic people running around. This is very different. So the last one we had was in the 60s. Um, things have changed a bit. We travel all over more, the world. More, more. I mean, let, yeah. Let's just look at the 1918. You know, that was basically caused, that flu epidemic, the pandemic that killed 50 to 100 million people, which, you know, at that time was a hell of a lot of people. Um, uh, the, it, the, it was the second wave where everyone died, not the first yeah. wave, the first yeah. wave, but it followed troop movements, right? It was because the troops were moving all over um, that people, that the virus spread and came back in the second wave. There were 75 million total people, total troops mobilized during three years of World War One. 75 million. Last year alone in the United States, 234 million people international yeah. came yeah. in out of the country. So you can't, you know, comparing to old times and these will end in it, we're living in a different world. And um, the fact that we have these, this pandemic is in virtually every country and will, may end up in every country. Yeah. Um, unless you're an island where no one goes to, like the Comoros. Um, you know, this is, a dip, this is fundamentally different. Um, the fact that, you know, China had its 80 days and they have new infections. Singapore had its 80 days. They had to close the country again because they got another wave. Yeah. Why did that happen? Because people travel. So using those old calculations to me is just I, I, absurd. I fully agree with you because we need to, in a sense, contradict these people that make things uh, too easy and, and, and simple. And, and it's not. And so... So we should learn from HIV, right? In HIV, we said there's no asymptomatic infection. Everyone gets sick, you know. So unless you have a prodromal syndrome, you never had HIV. Well, 50 to 60 percent of them actually had it. Yeah. Um, you know, travel played a large role in HIV. How you respond, how you put systems in place, how you can engage with the community. If you don't, the one thing we know from every pandemic is the community is not involved. If you're not actually getting your messaging, you're not working with the community and listening to them, you can't succeed. There Absolutely. are a lot of things we've learned about the HIV pandemic, even though it's fundamentally a different infection, we can't compare it because of the transmission routes. There's a lot we've learned, um, including about how we manage epidemiology and genetics. Um, we said the same thing about the HIV virus. It's not going to mutate much. You know, it'll be fine. Yeah, as soon as we start treating people, we saw a lot of genetic change. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, um, so we can learn some of these key things, but we, we've never had, we've not lived through one of these in the modern era. And to use, we need to learn things from the past, but to just say it's going to be like that is very it's, dangerous. It's very dangerous. So, Mark, I would like to thank you very much for being with us. It has been a pleasure. Uh, I hope to see you soon. Uh, Me too. Somewhere. And uh, maybe in part of our next year, we have, I mean, if we, if everything goes well, we'll have another festival of global health. Well, and, and, and we'll have a lot of things to speak about. Yeah. yeah. Take care. Take be care. Safe. Be ciao, safe. Ciao. 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 Be safe, my friends. Ciao, Bye. ciao, ciao.